Hey everybody, this is David Duford at Final Expense Agent Mentor, where I help agents like you succeed in the insurance business. And today in our top agent interview series, I have a disability insurance sales agent, Larry Schneider with me today. And a little bit about Larry. Uh, Larry is a disability insurance specialist with over 45 years of hands-on experience, exclusively specializing in disability insurance. And a little bit more about Larry. Over the years, over 50 disability insurance related articles have been published in many of the trade magazines that he's been a part of. And Schneider has lectured to many of the nation's leading associations, CPAs, and has appeared on television explaining the many contractual differences between policies offered by the insurance industry as well as being a panelist for a litigation conference. In addition, he is an expert witness consultant for disability insurance claims, which have been inappropriately denied and a national resource for hard to place insurance applicants, as well as a national source for application of business and individual standard cases. Larry is also the author of a nationally acclaimed training manual, the Encyclopedia of Disability Income Insurance, and the Anatomy of Denied Disability Insurance Claims, a manual which is used by many attorneys, and I can tell you personally, the Encyclopedia of Disability Income Insurance, I own it, it's great, definitely recommend it, we'll talk more about that later. And uh, Larry has also helped the American College substantially rewrite their Essentials of Disability Income Insurance Manual and has been a guest speaker at the MDRT's 2013 convention and has been a speaker at many webinars. And prior to his insurance career, headed up a department for one of the big eight CPA firms performing analytical studies on behalf of their clients. And uh, Larry, welcome to the interview. Thank you so much for joining. My pleasure. Thank you. Very good. So let's start from the top. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into the insurance business. Well, I started late in the second career. I used to be, as the uh, intro indicated, uh, a management consultant for one of those CPA firms. And uh, indirectly, even though the uh, CPA firm owned the client, I was instrumental in bringing in new business uh, on uh, different kind of studies. And uh, over the years that that occurred, and uh, it sort of morphed into the thought that uh, maybe I could sell and make more money, even though I was making a very nice income at that time. And I happened to see an advertisement in the paper, which talked about insurance and says, own your own business, no capital required. I went down to one of the meetings, and it turned out to be a meeting about uh, how to make money selling disability insurance. Well. Uh, everybody worked, and I hate to say this, with a canned um, presentation. Right. And I said, oh, my God, this can't possibly work. And I think this was, you know, uh, not a joke or anything like that, but a setup, uh, being, being a little bit cynical. But over a period of time, uh, after attending many meetings and seeing the commission checks being handed out, I said, well, maybe there's something to it. So we joined forces. I memorized the half an hour presentation, started to uh, sell for the company after resigning my other job and uh, moved on and uh, became a partner in the company and uh, so on and so forth. And I, I might add that uh, for 16 straight months, I was a national leader in selling disability insurance, not knowing anything about it beforehand. but. The company was great in training, and I became a trainer for the company, sharing the experiences that I picked up. So that's how I got into it, and uh, that was at age 39. Now, if you add 39 to 45 years doing this, you get an idea how old I am at this point. <laughs> so you, you got right into disability, and you've more or less just done that for the last 45 years. Is that correct? Hey, exactly, exactly. Perfect. So again, this uh, uh, part of this conversation today with you, Larry, is directed towards the newer agents, maybe that are trying to feel out, you know, what type of insurance line they want to represent. And so the question I want to ask you is if you can think of the newer agent in mind, uh, describe to them how selling disability insurance works in general and, and why, a, why a client would want to buy it too. Yeah, well, there's uh, two thoughts on that. Uh, one is that traditionally, in the American uh, mindset, life insurance has always been part of their uh, inventory as far as insurance is concerned. I mean, that's a, a given. Everybody knows uh, something's going to happen at some point in time. Could be sooner or later. With disability insurance, um, it, it you have to really create the need, and it's a different method of selling. It's different because 
most of the prospects you call on say, nothing ever is going to happen to me. I don't need it. Why should I have it? So creating the need, it's an emotional sale, and you have to show reasons why other than saying just you need it. And there's plenty of information out there which will help convert the, the non-believer into a believer. But I want to emphasize, and this is really the genesis of selling disability insurance, it's an emotional sale. And you really have to um, present case studies, so to speak, of people perhaps who didn't think they would ever need it. All of a sudden, they find out after taking the policy out that they just collected. As a matter of fact, just yesterday, uh, a wife of one of my clients called and she said her husband fell off the ladder. Now, she was against the insurance when he first took it out. But being a responsible person, he wanted it. And uh, here we go with the case in point, why it's so important to have. It's, you know, I, I say to a lot of prospects when we finally shake hands one way or the other, it's the ba biggest waste of the money in the world until you have to use it. So, you know, for, right. a, new, for a new agent, um, not only are you doing a service to your, your, your clients and your prospects, but it's not a bad way to earn a commission. Uh, the commissions typically... For most carriers, a 50% first year, and typically 10% thereafter, even for lifetime. So it's not uh, it's not a bad way to develop a nice uh, retirement program. So yeah, I yeah. say to uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. So just as you were saying, Larry, like you, you made a good point uh, a moment ago. You know, everybody agrees they're going to die. There's no there's no real arguing that point. However, yeah, right. like like you said, disability is something that happens much more than people imagine. However, it's not necessarily going to happen. So uh, when you say you need to create the need, you, you absolutely need to, wouldn't you think so? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, clearly there are more people in the hospitals than there are in funeral parlors at any given time. So clearly uh, the evidence is, is very strong. So um, let's let's talk a little bit more about you know, so you mentioned that disability has the way of, of being a kind of interesting because, you know, in, in my particular line selling final expense, it's a pretty good first year commission, but the renewals aren't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, much to be uh, enjoyed. However, it sounds, if correct me if I'm wrong, disability has the advantage of a very high first year commission. Case sizes are very, can be very large, plus a very high renewal driven business. Is, is that kind of how the, the product is? Absolutely. And if you think about it, even if you sold just one policy a week and the premium is 2000 that's 50000 a year, taking off for a couple of weeks vacation. In the second year, you get 10% on that 1000 So now you've made another um, bundle, so to speak, on top of uh, the second year, just selling one policy a week. But let's face it, you're not going to sell, the average agent is not going to sell, even in the first year, just one policy a week. And by the time he gets in the second year, uh, he should be on a roll. I mean, there's referrals. You do a good job. As like in any kind of business, you get referrals and you become stronger and more knowledgeable. And as you know, as everybody does know, knowledge is power. The more power you have, the more successful you're going to be. And is our dis how 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 much quality as as we relate to persistency? So new agents, persistency means how well does the business stick on the book? So with disability, is this a business that is it does it lapse after a couple of years? Does it last a long time? What kind of quality can you expect from the disability? I can't imagine in my forty five years I've been doing disability insurance anything lapsed other than somebody retiring and then they don't need it anymore. I can't picture, even in the worst scenarios where there's an economy downfall, that somebody says, I can't afford it. And there are ways to um, salvage that kind of situation. If income has gone down, uh, there are ways to bring down the premium where somebody could still maintain it on a lesser basis, as I just mentioned. But I haven't had any lapses. Once it's on the books, rarely does it... Uh, get removed either through competition or otherwise, simply because, as everybody knows, rates go up as the years progress. Everything is based on age. So if uh, another agent came in and said he had something better, which is very unlikely, uh, because usually what I, not usually, I always try to give the best that the industry has to offer, and I do represent 
all the insurance companies at this point in time, there are only about 13 carriers that remain in the insurance disability insurance industry. But for somebody to come in and say, I got something better, they'd be faced with the challenge of overcoming the premiums which have increased due to age. And uh, that's very hard to do. So lapses are basically, uh, then they do happen, of course, but the persistency is very high. So for, again, for the new agent in mind, you know, they may think, oh, geez, disability, how, how complex is that? Maybe they've seen the different kinds of policies that are available to prospects. So what I was hoping you could do, Larry, is kind of just describe in general how, how disability insurance works and what the common, most common policies are and, and, and how they actually go to work for the client when a disability claim comes in. Okay, let me back up a little bit on your question. Uh, there's also an old saying, and I do have a couple of old sayings in my bag. You don't <laughs> want to become a feature preacher, okay? Right. Because 99 times out of 10 or out of 100, <laughs> it's going to go over the prospect's head. What you want to do is create the benefit, what it's going to do for the client, meaning that if you do get disabled, it's going to help give you money so you can pay your rent, your food, and so on. But to answer your question more directly, getting away from what I just said, that you don't want to become a feature preacher, the way a policy works, and there's many options that are available when you apply for a policy, the genesis of any policy is total disability. And that basically says for most occupations, and there are different definitions based on occupation, for example, a ditch digger is not going to get the same definition for total disability as, for example, a doctor. And what I mean by definition, I'll give you an example, uh, and definitions trigger a benefit. For a doctor, for example, and any other white collar worker, the definition would normally say, unable to do the material and substantial duties of your occupation, period. And you know, you could add verbally past the definition, even though you're working in another occupation, making more money. So if somebody in sales, for example, you, David, loses your voice and you had a policy and you couldn't do the duties of your occupation because you lost your ability to communicate, even though, for example, you became a computer nerd making more money, you would still mm -hmm. get the full benefit from the policy. And as long as you pay for it with after-tax dollars, the benefits will be tax-free. That's one benefit. Now, let's say, for example, that somebody hurt their back. And they can only, you know, uh, they couldn't get to work two out of five of the days. He, they have to rest on a Tuesday and Thursday to recuperate. All things being equal, that's two out of five is 40% of the week or 40% of your income. Then the policy would also pay under what they call a residual or a proportionate loss of income, 40% of the monthly benefit. So there's something coming in there. Another option would be a future increase option. Let's say somebody didn't take out as much as they needed initially, or they got the most they could get based on their income, but their income is going to go up dramatically in the next five years. Maybe they're at a residency, whatever. Uh, the future increase option basically says that we'll give you more coverage with no medical questions asked, meaning if they've had some major health issue, that is overlooked. There's no medical questions asked. All they have to do to get that particular additional benefit through the future increase option is show that they're, um, they have the financial capability of proving they're making X number of dollars, which will get them more. Another benefit is a cost of living adjustment. That should be semi self explanatory. Once somebody is collecting the monthly benefit, over a period of time, the cost of living adjustment will increase that monthly benefit to keep up with inflation because inflation is going to erode the buying power of the initial monthly benefit. So the cost of living adjustment gives them more income. Usually it's a certain percentage, say 3%, uh, could be compound, could be simple, of the monthly benefit. And during that period of time, there's a waiver premium that kicks in, meaning while you're disabled after the elimination period, and that's like any deductible, then the um, waiver premium says you don't have to pay the premium. And if and when you do recover and go back to work, all the back payments that somebody has missed, those are wiped out, forgiven, so to speak. 
So there are few options like that, catastrophic, which pays more if there's a catastrophic type of disability, which is really uh, similar to a long-term care definition where you have to be able to satisfy two out of five of the ADLs, activities of daily living. So some give a return of premium. If somebody says, for example, I'll never use it, it's a waste of money, a nice rebuttal or a, another close would be, well, would you be happy if you could get all your money back, less paid claims, if you never use it? It's a win-win situation. So some companies offer what they call a return of premium. So each company has, uh, I shouldn't say each company, but there are some companies that have unique uh, options that make their policy maybe more or less attractive uh, compared to some others. It just depends on, you know, what the situation is. So, so there's a lot of ability to, to customize the product based on the goals of, of the prospect, what they want to accomplish. Like if they want a longer elimination period or a shorter elimination period, um, that's something you can, you can put into that particular disability product, correct? Correct. And then, you know, going on to your thought, there's also shorter and longer benefit periods in addition to longer and shorter elimination periods. So you could again customize it if somebody says, I want it, but I can't afford the premium that you just showed me, which means the benefits would have been paid tax-free to age 65 to 67. There's also a two-year benefit period, which brings down the premium dramatically. And then later on, if they can, they could always trade in that policy uh, for a longer benefit period. And when I say trade in, it'll be a reissue based on obtained age and new medical information. It's not a literal trade in where uh, you get credit for the first one. You start all over, but you can do that. Right, so one, one question many new agents have is, is trying to understand what are the ideal prospects to target uh, for disability insurance? Is there a particular group of people that make the best disability prospects? If so, who, who are they? And, and then how do you actually uh, get in front of them, and what, what are your preferred prospecting uh, approaches? Well, okay, good question. Uh, I'm going to reverse that a little bit. First of all, everybody is a prospect, but there are some prospects who are very difficult to get in front of. For example, a doc any high-income uh, prospect, for example, whether it be an attorney or a doctor, there's a lot of agents sitting in the waiting room all wanting to see the doctor, meaning that They've been through this probably a thousand times because everybody wants a high commission prospect. So my recommendation is, especially for somebody that's starting off in the business, you go to an area where very few agents have already called on that prospect and you have a clear field, so to speak. First of all, the person you're speaking to, as successful as they are, are not yet sophisticated in understanding how insurance works or how disability policy works. So you will become their guru, so to speak, in terms of education, explaining everything that we just talked about, how a policy works, why you should have it. And then you could graduate as you develop knowledge and experience and learn to overcome objections. You go to the next level. Now, what I started off with, to get back to the original question, who's the best prospect? I started off working in industrial centers, a roofer, a plumber, each having a, a certain uh, loft or a bay in an industrial center. Very few agents go there to call on them, and I was very successful. As I got more experienced and uh, was able to handle more objections with rebuttals and things like that and uh, closing techniques, I went on to the next level, which is maybe an architect or even a psychologist. Psychologists are good for this reason. They work behind closed doors, and agents don't know how to open that door and in that case, simultaneously and concurrently with everything else I just mentioned, you could do some direct mail. You send out a letter that might get some interest. The psychologist or psychiatrist will call you and invite you in to hear your presentation. So as time you know, passes on, you get more sophisticated and your level of expertise increases, of course, and you're able to be competitive in a more sophisticated market. But in the beginning for new agents, I would stay away from any high commission prospect. Those are the people that have already been uh, approached many, many times. 
but there's plenty of room. It's it's a very undersold uh, commodity, undersold product, simply because everybody is dealing with life insurance, with health insurance, with critical critical illness, uh, final expense, you know, and so on. So it's it's still a wide open market, contrary to what I just mentioned, even with doctors and so on, especially if they could get into it, either an association or a residency program through the university. There's plenty of opportunities. Uh, there have been books published on how to prospect, and uh, part of my encyclopedia, and separately, I've also published a book on how to prospect. So I hope that answers a little bit of your question. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So it's mainly the, uh, and I, I used to have, it's funny you mentioned that, Larry, I, I used to have a, uh, a fitness business, and it was in kind of a more industrial, kind of off the beaten path. Uh, and I never had anybody call on me except one day I had an insurance man walk in and he mentioned health insurance. <laughs> and it's the only, it's the only insurance man that's ever walked in me on, on me in those five years. So I, I bet you, especially with business people, they're so head down into their business. They're plowing their profits back in, reinvesting, growing the business. They half the time, probably most of the time, they don't think about this stuff. And uh, I imagine just showing up is, is powerful because there's less of us today than there used to be. And, uh, you know, these guys are also, uh, how do you say, um, they're going to hear you out. You know, they're in business. They sell too. You know, they respect people that show up and uh, it will at least give you a moment of time. So you, you do more of, it sounds like you more advocate more of a uh, face-to-face, belly-to-belly approach than, at least initially than, than phoning for appointments. Absolutely. I mean, it's too easy for, for some at the other end of a, a phone to say, I'm busy, call me back, or forget it. It's so easy to do that. There's no confrontation. There's no emotional uh, eyeball to eyeball and walking. And I used to literally walk in on somebody and with the presentation, uh, basically would say, uh, I'm Larry Schneider and you know, you're know you the owner of the business and I have some very important information to go with you concerning the ownership of the business. Now, there's plenty of truth to that, but it's really a, a major type of hook where somebody say, what are you talking about? What do you mean the ownership of the business? Well, because this is confidential, I'll meet a table at desk where we could discuss this. Invariably, 95% of the time, I'd be in his office 30 seconds later going into my presentation. And if he got disabled, he would lose ownership of the business. So there was right. a lot of truth to it, but a pretty powerful door opener. So, you know, I, I was doing the math here a second ago, 45 years. That means you got, you got started in disability in 1973. Is that right? Uh, 72. 72. Okay. So uh, maybe, maybe it's now longer than 45 years. <laughs> you, I you've lost count. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I'm sure, just like in, in many other lines of insurance, the, the business has changed dramatically. Um, I'm curious to see what kind of changes you've seen and, and, and how these changes have affected the ability to sell insurance or sell disability and, and market it? Actually, it really, uh, in the broad brush sense, it hasn't changed. You still have to create the need. Uh, the, uh, there's underwriting. The insurance industry, uh, to answer your question, has gotten much more sophisticated in terms of underwriting. It, it, I wouldn't say that uh, in the past, Things slip by and they've had to pay out claims that maybe weren't appropriate simply because in underwriting, uh, the, either the agent didn't, for whatever reason, put down all the information in the application. Either the applicant didn't share it, the agent may have uh, decided it wasn't important enough. Uh, but today's market, the insurance underwriters have got a lot of additional tools at their disposal to underwrite an application. and. Uh, I would say they probably put in a few more exceptions than they did in the past for the reason I just mentioned. Uh, but the product has gotten more liberal. There's been a few options been added. Uh, nothing major has changed, just enhancements. The uh, participation, which means how much can somebody get on a maximum basis. I mean, for example, somebody that's even making a million dollars a year, and that's possible, is still only going to get a certain amount. There's a point of diminishing returns. Somebody making, for example, 50000 a year would get roughly 60% of their income covered. Now, 100000 which is twice that, you would think that they would get uh, another 5000 on top of that, 10000 a month. 
when somebody makes a hundred thousand, they're only getting about eighty five hundred a month, whereas the person's making fifty thousand can get or a hundred let me back up, I made a mistake. Somebody making a hundred thousand will get five thousand a month, sixty percent of a hundred thousand. Somebody making two hundred thousand is only going to get about eighty five hundred. So as the income goes up, the chart, and they don't use percentages at that point, the chart will give less all else being equal. So the more you make, and you can convert how much you're getting to a percentage. So the more you make indirectly, the lower the percentage becomes. What's the rationale behind that? Why, why do insurance carriers cap it at a lower uh, percentage uh, for the higher income earners? Well, that's a good question. Uh, you would think it would be a level playing field from that point of view. But uh, in the conservative uh, uh, towers, so to speak, they figured how much does somebody really need to survive? They want to give them some motivation to hurry up and recover. If somebody's getting a straight 60%, regardless of how much they're earning, somebody might say, you know, why should I hurry up and recover? I'll sit on the boat for another couple of months. Uh, granted, there's some medical justification to being paid, but that's the thinking behind uh, the reason why the percentages go down as a result of uh, converting how much you're getting to a percentage. So we've been talking about, you know, the typical disability sale being a white collar professional or a, uh, a businessman uh, and, and with the goal of just replacing, you know, the income loss due to disability. What other type of financial solutions can disability insurance products can be used for? Because there's more than just replacing income, isn't there? Well, I, that's a good question. I think, uh, I think if I hear what you're saying, what other products are available in the disability insurance marketplace that could help replace income? For example, um, in addition to getting an individual policy, and you can, re you can use the word RDI, individual in individual disability insurance, there's a business overhead policy, which is a separate policy, which will, in addition to getting covered for your own income, pays the business expenses, whether it be a salary of somebody, rent, electricity, all those business expenses. And that is a tax deductible premium, whereas the individual is not a tax deduction item. And even in certain cases where it is allowed, you shouldn't pay it uh, with pre-tax dollars because then the benefits are going to be taxable. So getting back to the, the next product, which I call the business overhead, uh, that pays the business expenses. There's a key man policy, which let's say you have a rainmaker uh, working in the organization while the owner is playing golf. If that rainmaker goes down, the business is going to suffer. So you could put a policy on that key man, which means if he or she gets disabled, the money could go to the business where they could continue to pay the key person or hire somebody else and use that money to pay that salary while still paying the disabled person's salary. The last one, and there's one or two more after this, but they're inconsequential. The next one is a buy-sell agreement, which is used when there's a partnership. If one of the partners gets disabled, the able partner gets the money in a buy-sell agreement and will then pay the disabled partner to relinquish their shares of the business. Now, that's a very important uh, product. And uh, in today's market, if I was out selling, because very few agents who even do sell the product will offer a buy-sell agreement, I would focus on that because it makes you very, very unique in the marketplace. And getting back to what we said earlier, the marketplace is not all that crowded. Very few agents are selling disability insurance for various reasons. You know, there's a lot of chatter in the mailbox, other products. I would uh, use that as a door opener if you walk into a partnership type of environment, whether it be attorneys or an architect or a CPA or anybody like that. And if you do it with a CPA and you get them as a client, they're going to give you lots of referrals because they right. um, control the uh, the string, so to speak, of their clients. So those are the basic uh, three or four uh, policies or products that are out there that can be sold. Well, let's, let's uh, take it back to thinking about the agent coming into this. Um, I'm a big advocate. 
I don't know how you feel about this, Larry, but when I train agents, I, whether they do, what doesn't matter what line, but I think it's extremely important to specialize and become a master of one thing, at least initially. And my question to you, is that something that can be done in the disability insurance market? Is this something that you can just solely sell and, ex and exclusively offer? Well, that's what I've done, so there's your answer. And the more specialized you become, um, the more knowledgeable you are, but it gives you a heads up, meaning that it's uh, credibility when you say, look, I only sell disability insurance, and you can get some recognition from that statement from the client or the prospect saying, hey, I'm really dealing with specialists. He's had experience. He focuses on one product. He better know what he's talking about. And, you know, if you do specialize in one product, eventually you will know what you're talking about. And, and next question here. So we kind of hit on this a little bit, but just in case there's anything else we could cover, what are the biggest advantages of selling disability insurance to the agent? I mean, you want to convince the agent that disability insurance should be the product they sell, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So let's say we have an agent who says, everything you've said okay. sounds great, Larry, and I, I'm thinking okay. about specializing it. What, what are my advantages to doing so versus, say, selling life insurance to business owners? All right. I'm gonna, you're going to get the answer by me asking you a question. Do you like working at night? No. All right. Selling disability insurance on the conscious <laughs> side of the coin is a daytime business. <laughs> that's bit, that's really, look, that's a big deal, guys. I mean, it's very, you can come into this and, and trust me. I mean, when we get into business, especially if you're younger, you don't mind working nights, but, you know, my, my fourth kid is going to be here in May. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, I've done 10 plus years grinding it out, seven, eight, nine o'clock at night, get home at 10. You get to a point, even with ambition, it's you, you want to retain some sort of family life, you know, and Absolutely. working during the day is is a tremendous advantage, I would think. Yeah. OK, that's 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 part of it. And earlier we talked about the commissions. And of course, the psychological income, knowing that you're going to be successful is another additive to the total picture. But the daytime commissions and not having that much competition because everybody's out there grinding, uh, you know, for life insurance on the other products. So um, in my mind, um, and I work nights in the very beginning, I, I get home because a lot of my prospects were contractors and things like that. Again, the blue collar market, which other agents didn't call on, and they, would, they themselves were out working from nine to five. So uh, much of my business came uh, working from five to uh, nine or 10 o'clock at night. But I, uh, but to pay myself back for not seeing the family, I only work four days a week. I took off Friday and Saturday. Right, and, and, and I know you're not doing this. You're not knocking working nights. It's, sometimes you just have to, but I think certainly there's some benefit in the long term to- uh, Well, especially, yeah, yeah well, I mean, I work during the day as well, uh, but most of the business came nighttime because the company's product at that time, and we're going back uh, 45 years, and this is unheard of, uh, there was no deductible. Everybody got paid from day one. Wow. And everybody would pay lifetime. Okay. So it was also an easy product to sell. Plus, we had a presentation that uh, was designed over many years. It took a half an hour to complete the presentation, but it was very convincing. It had a, uh, a lot of reverse psychology built into it. For example, if you could qualify, and everybody likes to think that they can. What do you mean, if I could qualify? Of course I can. Well, let's take an application, see if that uh, comes out to be the truth. I, rem I would even think that most people or many salespeople are fairly competitive. Picture this, David. If you go into a store, let's say you're looking for a television and um, you're negotiating with the guy and the, the salesperson, and they said, this is the last one, and we've reduced the price. Wouldn't that be a magnet to make the sale? It said, I, it's the last one. I want it. Definitely would drive the urgency. That's for sure. A, exactly. So that is a little bit of reverse psychology. I don't know if we're getting this in anymore. I mean, it's too good to be true. We've lowered our uh, uh, benchmark, so to speak. But um, getting back to the, the, the question, it's, it's a daytime business on the commissions. Plus, your, your persistency is going to be great because um, very few people in the 
past have called on him, which proves that uh, very few people, or it suggests that very few people are going to call him the same prospect in the future. And even if they did, uh, the fact that a couple of years have gone by where health could have changed, meaning that the new agent, even if he was going to replace it, is going to have to overcome, uh, how do you cover me now for my pre-existing condition, which is not excluded in my current policy? So there's lots of, uh, lots of good stuff out there to uh, be successful. Yeah, you know, and I, I can, I'll add one thing just in listening to your explanation. Uh, again, this is kind of the difference between, and I'm finding this out, I'm in my early 30s, Larry, but um, there's a point where if you're on the, the old uh, uh, hamster wheel and you got to get up every morning and make a sale to make a living, again, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's honorable work that we do. So if you sell life insurance, for example, but with disability, you know, you sell, 200 cases a year and you do that for 10 years, just, I couldn't imagine the kind of renewal income. It must be fantastic again, because this business is so sticky, you know? And so if you get to the point later on in life, you, you want to, uh, you know, go down a couple of gears, you certainly can with the block of business that you made. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, even in my business right now, David, I'm more what they call reactive than proactive. In other words, uh, I get a lot of business through the internet, you know, either my reputation, the articles, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so I don't have to prospect proactively. In other words, I get business simply because of, you know, what I've done out there. Other agents have called me and uh, financial planners and, uh, you know, all, all the, the total picture of all the networking that could possibly happen has now come to fruition. Right. So, absolutely. Okay. And, and I'm still keeping busy. Yeah. At a, Doing, in your 70s. Without working, without working. <laughs> <laughs> right. Sure. Again, that's an advantage of being a specialist, I'd say. You're a, a sought a, after. Absolutely. No, you're, you're 100% correct there. So let's, let's fast forward here. Imagine 20 years in the future. I don't know uh, how much you're paying attention, but there's an awful lot of, of chatter and talk about how robots are going to take over the world and we're going to lose 75% <laughs> of our jobs in 20 years. Where do you see disability sales? and the insurance agent being in 20 years. Is the market still going to be there? Is it going to be gone? What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's, that's a tough question to answer. I mean, I, all I could do is uh, give you a hypothetical. Uh, it's been around for over 100 years, disability insurance. And uh, I don't see it changing because as long as people are working and need their income, uh, granted, if the workforce goes down because of Robert, robots, that's normally in a factory kind of environment. And uh, disability insurance is not necessarily sold, the kind of insurance that I'm talking about, to a factory worker. It's sold to business owners primarily. And that doesn't mean that you can't sell it to somebody that works in an office that's an employee. Um, there they may already have coverage through a group long-term disability policy or have no coverage at all. But typically, the employee, uh, the employee working for a company has always believed, and uh, incorrectly so, that the employer will take care of them. It's like their big daddy uh, right. away from home. But I don't, I don't see the market changing uh, in the next 20 years. And, you know, it, it's funny even thinking about that as you, as you talk and describe it. You know, it sounds as if disability is sold to the, again, when we think white collar, we think of the creative class, you know, the, the group of people that have a particular skill maybe it's people skills or maybe it's uh, intellectual capacity or you know just such a specialized skill like surgery or law that you know robots can only replace so much you made a very good point and and luckily yeah, the that market are, isn't that you know robots will be good when there's a repetitive and redundant uh, type of activity and that can, I mean obviously they already have that in car manufacturing you know, and so on, and uh, Walmart is putting it in, Amazon is doing certain things. But, you know, for our market, when I say our market, those who sell disability insurance, uh, I don't think you'll come face to face with a robot as being your competition. I think there'll be plenty of opportunities and plenty of prospect. There's just sometimes not even enough hours in a day if you really want to, you know, pursue uh, and, and retiring sooner than later. Hey, hey, good idea, guys. Just just sell the robot company owners. That's the, that's the solution. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> so, Larry, I've really enjoyed this talk. This has okay. been amazing. Uh, if, for anybody interested in talking to you 
uh, directly, um, if they're interested in, in your books and material and training, how can we reach out to you? Okay, well, I have a toll-free number, which is 800-551-6211, or they could go to my website, and there'll be some uh, educational information. My website is not necessarily a selling uh, website. It's a consultative type of website where people can really learn about disability insurance, have confidence in uh, knowing that they're somewhat educated and uh, a little bit more sophisticated in understanding the ins and outs. And as a result uh, of that information, uh, hopefully they contact me, and which has happened, of course. Uh, but going to my website, which is the W's, www.di-resource-center.com. And there they could get a lot of the information that we've already talked about for the last, uh, you know, uh, 40 minutes or so. Yeah, and, and I would highly recommend uh, to purchase uh, the Encyclopedia of Disability book that Larry uh, created. It's, it's, it really does answer all and every question related uh, that you may have about disability. And, and by the way, for you guys watching this, I'll put the links below, including the phone number, as well as the uh, website itself, so that you can uh, reach out to Larry directly. So, Larry, thank you so much again for joining me today. I really enjoyed it, and, and uh, I know people watching this and listening have found it extremely helpful. Okay, David, thanks for allowing me to do that. And if anybody needs any uh, insight or assistance, um, they know where to reach me now. And best of luck to everybody. Very good. You take care, Larry. Thank, Thank you. you. All right.